is Ashley Fry, and I'm an Indigenous Affairs Officer with the U.S. Department of State's Cultural Heritage Center. Um, some of you uh, may know me from previous a previous conference where I represented at uh, the Department of Interior's Office of the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. Um, I've been working on repatriation off and on since um, 2016, and um, I'm hope to keep doing this more and more in the future and hope to see more successful repatriations. I think that the tides seem to start have started to turn um, both with Native American repatriations, but just also repatriations internationally. So I think um, I think we're going to hopefully see some more repatriations um, to come. And I'll turn it over to Brooke and David to let them introduce themselves. Thank you, Ashley. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Brooke Hobby. I'm with DOI's Office of International Affairs, and I'm joined by my colleague, David Downs. Um, we're really happy to be here to speak with you all today. Um, and big thanks to AIA um, for inviting us. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about the role of the Department of the Interior in supporting requests for assistance from tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations seeking repatriation of ancestral remains and tangible cultural heritage um, from abroad. Um, part of the role of our office is to serve as a central point of contact to help um, coordinate international repatriation issues for Interior. Um, we work closely with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, the National NAGPRA Program, um, the Solicitor's Office and a number of other offices across Interior that work on these issues. Um, you can find our contact information um, with a quick web search, um, DOI International Repatriation, and that will bring up our International Repatriation webpage. Um, we also, of course, work closely with the Department of State, since they're the lead government um, representative for interacting with foreign countries. Um, they're often the best place to start um, when you're seeking federal assistance. Um, they loop us in um, on any issues that we can help with. Um, they're very familiar with our, our roles and expertise. Um, and depending on the issue, uh, our office can help find the right experts um, or authority within the department to help. Um, one example of how Interior helps with international repatriations is um, when a foreign museum requests input from uh, the U.S. government as a condition for agreeing to a tribe's um, request for repatriation. Sometimes the museum will ask how we would address an analogous situation in the United States. Um, and because uh, we have the National NACRA program at Interior, um, we can provide that information. Um, as Ashley mentioned in a session yesterday um, regarding the repatriation from Karl May um, Museum in Germany, sometimes Interior can help explain to foreign governments or uh, museums um, the special status that Indian tribes have in the United States. Um, when it comes to the foreign auctions, including um, the auctions in Paris um, where um, sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony are, are put up for sale. Um, Interior has worked very closely with the State Department to raise public awareness um, and put pressure on the French government um, to intervene in some cases, um, including through direct outreach several years ago by the Secretary of the Interior. Um, and another way um, we can help is publicizing successful repatriations um, that set a good example for, for museums, um, like as we did last year with the, the repatriation from the National Museum of Finland um, that returned ancestral remains to the tribes connected with Mesa Verde. Um, as, as many know well, there are real limits to what Interior and the US government can do within the jurisdiction of a foreign country um, we have to rely on moral arguments and diplomacy, and we can and will make those arguments. Um, and sometimes they help, and we are here to help in any way we can. 
Um, David, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Uh, thank you, Brooke. Uh, I guess I think you've summed it up really well, uh, the role of the Department of the Interior and our office. Um, and uh, I guess I would just add that uh, both of us are, are available. Um, anytime you have questions or think you might uh, find the Interior Department's uh, services to be useful. And, and we're very uh, happy to, to, to try and help. And, and uh, to the extent we have been able to support tribes in, in this area, uh, I think very, very proud of, of, of those efforts. Um, thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Um, did did uh, did anyone else want to add anything? Um, sure, I'll go ahead and just give a little bit of an explanation about um, State Department's role with regard to international repatriation. Um, and I want to preface this as I did yesterday with saying that um, we don't necessarily need to be involved. A lot of times. Um, foreign governments or foreign museums will reach out to our embassies especially um, to make sure that um, they feel good <laughs> about the repatriation request. Really, it's about trying to make the museum or the government um, confident in the repatriation. But um, you know, we're here to serve as a resource as well. Um, we can help with connecting tribes with um, personnel in our embassies, um, or even foreign museum personnel. Um, and oftentimes our embassies already have those connections through other um, projects, but it's it's helpful sometimes to reach out. Um, and if you're not getting any traction with reaching out to our embassies or consulates, because a lot of times they do get a lot of um, external email requests coming in, um, please feel free to reach out to us. In fact, if you want to do that initially, sometimes that can sort of make things move a little quicker if we can make that initial introduction. Um, and, you know, I, we always encourage museums and foreign governments to work directly with tribes. And I said this yesterday, but tribes are the subject matter experts of their own cultural heritage, and they are the um, appropriate custodians of that cultural heritage. Um, so it, it works well if a tribe has a direct relationship with um, the museum. And we, we do often collaborate with Interior, um, like Brooke had mentioned about um, previous administrations um, have written letters to foreign governments um, explaining the relationship that the U.S. government has with tribal governments. I'm um, explaining that that is a nation to nation relationship. Um, and then also explaining how um, particular repatriations would be handled domestically. But we also uh, sometimes foreign governments request what's called a diplomatic note, which is just sort of an official um, request to the government to assist with um, the repatriation if, if the um, institution with the collections abroad is a private museum. If it's a federal museum, then that diplomatic notice serves sort of as an official request um, to work with tribes um, or Native Hawaiian communities um, on repatriations. Um, and then we also have exchange programs that um, we, we implement. So one of those is the International Visitor Leadership Program. <clears throat> where we bring, um, well, we did in 2018, we brought um, foreign museum uh, leaders to the United States to meet with tribes directly. Um, but there are also other um, programs like the Fulbright program that offer exchange um, between um, the U.S. Um, 
scholars uh, and international entities. Um, and then um, the last thing I, I want to sort of touch on is is press that that Brooke mentioned. Um, we always look to the tribes um, as to whether or not they would like us to issue press or they're okay with us issuing press around a repatriation. If they're not, we will not um, issue any press release. Um, and then any press that a tribe puts out, we are always happy to um, sort of reinforce that with our, through our um, social media channels as well. So um, we're really here to serve as a resource and assist when it's helpful. Um, and uh, you know, feel free to reach out to to me or Brooke or David um, with any requests you might have. Thank you, Brooke. Um, is there um, any, or does anyone else want to say anything before I move to Q&A? Okay. Cool. Uh, here's the first question. Does the DOI or State Department have a web page about international repatriation that includes contact information? So I mentioned the DOI international repatriation web page, and I can put the, the URL for that in the chat now. Um, but we do have uh, contacts for um, interior leads on this topic um, on, on that web page. We also have a, a web page. Um, it has, I'm sure several of you have worked with or know Allison Davis um, at the Cultural Heritage Center. Um, when I came on board in March of this year, I took on the um, the Indigenous Affairs portfolio from her. So her name is still listed as the contact on um, the Cultural Heritage Center's website, but the email, which is coldprofitstate.gov, comes to all of us. So it will get um, uh, delegated to the right person if an email is sent to that email address, but I'll drop our URL in the chat as well. Thank you. Next question. Have you worked with any particular countries that work well or are more open to address and support repatriation? Um, I can sort of take that one on. Um, I don't know that I have an answer to whether or not a particular country is um, open, but I have it does seem that working with governmental entities um, is easier um, or quicker, I guess I should say. The private entities um, sometimes have more layers to go through um, and aren't necessarily, um, they don't necessarily hold to the same, um, I don't wanna say the word standards, but recommendations as the the federal museum so i i feel like in the past we've we've had um smoother um repatriations with with federal museums uh, if i could just add to that i i think um i agree with what ashley just said i i would note that we I think we often get involved if something has not uh, gone as well as it could, right? Because uh, as, as Ashley mentioned, we, we defer to the tribes as the subject matter experts on what items uh, are of interest to them and their value and the importance of returning those items. And, uh, and so the, the tribe is leading, typically leading the engagement with the museum and then we get involved if perhaps there's a sticking point, you know, for example, some museums or uh, may re require an official request from the US government, as Ashley mentioned, or might want to know whether we would handle the repatriation 
in a similar way under domestically under NAGPRA. So then, and then we get involved. So we, we just, uh, we may not be seeing all the repatriations and, and we may not be seeing those that work most, most smoothly. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Which countries were involved in the exchange program? Were there any countries that stood out as being significantly more open to repatriation? So um, I think there were, oh, excuse me, I just got a little feedback. Um, I think there were about 12 or 13 um, museums that were represented in that exchange program. And by and large, they were Western European um, in origin. And I think that we find, at least with the repatriations that come across our desks, that um, most of the collections um, that tribes seek repatriation from are in Western Europe. I um, mean, I think that um, it really depends on which museums you're looking to. And again, going back to the previous question about um, countries or types of museums that we've had more success with, I, I, mean, I think it's still, it's kind of answers that your other question as well. But um, and I, I want to sort of reinforce what David said, that we don't necessarily see all of the repatriations that come through or even hear about them. And um, so it might, um, it might be that certain countries or museums have had more success with repatriations um, and tribal um, engagement. And we may just not be aware of all of that. But I, I do say that most of the, the museums that are, are represented are Western European museums. Um, Brooke or David, did you want to add to that at all? No? <laughs> all right, let's move to the next question. This question comes from my good friend, Martin Schultz. Is there any program similar to the IVLP that would, for example, bring TIPOs to Europe or certain countries in Europe to, to help locate ancestors and cultural patrimony and help start a dialogue on repatriation in person? That's a good question. Um, and I sort of want to preface this with, I have not been at the State Department for very long. Um, and I am still learning about all of the exchange programs that we do have. Um, and I mentioned earlier the Fulbright program, but that's very much for individuals within the US. Um, but I'm not aware, I'm not saying that they don't exist. I just would have to check to see if there were um, programs that would bring groups of people from the US to, um, to European uh, countries to have this sort of exchange with museums. Um, so I, that's if that's something that, um, you would be interested in, please feel free to reach out to me directly and I will see what um, what we, uh, what programs we do have available for an exchange like that. Brooke or David, did you wanna add anything to that one? Well, uh, you know, for, for interior, my, my understanding is that the NACPRA grants program does not uh, provide for funding for international repatriations. So I guess <laughs> I have an answer, but it's, it's not a positive one, unfortunately. Thank you. Here is the next question from Lillian. I apologize if this has been asked in one of the other sessions but I haven't been able to watch them all. Okay, so is there a specific international legal framework that you rely on if another country is not cooperating with the tribe? That's a good one. 
That is a good question. Um, so there is the 1970 UNESCO convention, but really what that, um, the way that the US um, implements that is through cultural property agreements um, with foreign countries. And most of the time, actually all of the time, it's um, to the benefit of those other countries. So you, the US as um, a market for goods that are coming in um, perhaps illegally from foreign countries, that's what our cultural property agreements um, speak to. Um, and most of those agreements are with countries that do not or would not have a significant market for Native American um, cultural property. Um, I've been asked before whether or not we could um, have a sort of a direct agreement with a foreign country um, that speaks directly to cultural property coming out of the US. Um, this was asked yesterday. Um, and the short answer is probably, but it would be very difficult because it would be at a high level that that agreement would have to be made. Um, and I'm not sure that realistically it would have much impact um, because we do not have um, sort of a legal mechanism within the US. Uh, I, I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with the um, Stop Act, which is still in um, in Congress and hasn't been passed yet, but um, you know that's sort of one thing that, or one piece of legislation that might assist with um, stemming the tide of international repatriation, or I guess international um, exportation of Native American cultural items um, from the U.S. But um, there really isn't an overarching um, international legal framework that we can look to um, to um, re require foreign governments to repatriate um, cultural heritage. Thank you, Ashley. Did you want to add anything, Brooke or David? Thank you. Were you going to say something, Rick? <laughs> no, I was just going to say Ashley um, answered it very well. Thank you. Here's the next question. This question is from our good friend Sarah Glass. Do you keep track, or wait, do you keep, do you keep or track data on international repatriations that your offices have assisted with? or international repatriations to the U.S. in general? So I, I can start, I guess. Um, so within our office for, um, you know, the requests that we've received and, and that we've worked on, um, we do try to keep track of those, those items. Um, but as, as David and Ashley pointed out earlier, um, we're not aware of all of the international repatriations that take place. And so we, we don't really have a good sense of that universe as far as I can tell. I just wanna, I'm sorry, David, you can go ahead. Sorry, I would just add with respect to our, our tracking, we don't always even know the full story because sometimes a tribe will contact us and they'll ask for certain things, information or, or contacts or whatever it might be. And we respond and then we don't hear again. And we, we don't know, um, we figure people are busy, so we're not going to ping them if, if they don't need anything more from us. But what that means is we don't necessarily know the resolution of the, that case. And I just wanted to add that um, we work collaboratively. And so um, sharing information when um, we're allowed to share information, as long as it's you know not law enforcement sensitive or protected in another way. Um, and so I think that <clears throat> from government agency to government agency, we're all fairly well aware of what each other have worked on. Um, so as you know, 
tracking, as far as tracking goes, um, we do keep track of what repatriations we've worked on. Um, but again, you know, it's just what we have been made aware of. Thank you. Here is our next question. Uh, this question comes from our good friend, David Barland Lyles. What are the emerging areas of collaboration and innovation that your programs would like to enter into? What are perceived roadblocks or inhibitions? So um, I would like to see more um, uh, exchange elements with um, tribes, tribal museums, and foreign museums. Um, and another thing that the State Department tries to do is emphasize um, the importance of contemporary Native American art and craft work. So encouraging foreign museums to um, partner with Native American artists for exhibitions or to collect contemporary Native American art and craft work. So that's something I'd like to see more of is um, more uh, exchange elements between tribal museums um, and Native American artists and craftspeople. Um, and then also um, more emphasis on contemporary work and exhibitions in foreign museums. Ashley, not to put you on the spot, but did, did you want to say anything about, um, you know, like trying to get a handle on like the existing digital collections and? Um, yes, to... yes, I, I can talk a little bit about that. So, um, <laughs> you know, there's, we, although we have a very um, open and collaborative um, staff level, working group on um, international repatriation matters. Um, we all uh, have bandwidth taken up by various other um, duties as assigned in our roles. Um, and we have not, unfortunately, <clears throat> been able to dedicate enough staff time to looking at publicly available um, museum collection information from foreign museums. <clears throat> and I, you know, this is also sort of an unwieldy task for any individual or couple of people who want to take this on from, you know, at the tribal level um, as well. So if we could get sort of a a, a group together that includes um, government officials, includes tribal government um, and cultural heritage professionals, um, academics, students um, together to uh, mine that publicly available information. And in some cases, you know, it may also be possible for us to reach out through our embassies to directly contact museums um, about their collections. This is something that we um, tried to do uh, earlier this year, but because of um, COVID, that sort of threw a wrench into um, our plans. But um, you know, putting something together where we can create a database or some other easily searchable um, app or uh, electronically based system that tribes could access through a username and password. <clears throat> and I think that this is not something that's going to happen overnight. It's definitely a long term project. But that's another thing that we would like to see happen. Um, because Tribes sometimes know that there are collections of their cultural heritage abroad, but may not know exactly where that that those collections sit. And hopefully something like this would be able to provide better information and more <clears throat> descriptive information about what collections are um, in foreign museums.
Thank you, Ashley. Go ahead, David. So, you know, uh, so this is a very good question and um, I feel like I, I can't really speak for our program as such. Uh, there, We don't really have a, a program on international repatriation. Uh, you know, we, we, we provide support as, as requested. Um, it's kind of a, a collateral duty um, to the other international work that, that we're charged with in our office. Um, and our, our budget officer, our budget office would, would uh, not uh, want me to, to be proposing new programs and uh, without their clearance. But certainly the, uh, the need that Ashley identified, it seems really important and a fruitful for, uh, area for collaboration. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, I, we, we also deal with uh, international wildlife conservation and trade issues. And in that context, there have been uh, hackathons. There, there have been like public competitions, which I may or may not have governmental support, um, but they are, you know, places where uh, people tackle problems with te new technologies. Um, and you could envision um, some kind of collaborative effort or, or, you know, competition between different teams to come up with solutions to the, the kind of data problem that, that Ashley identified. Another area where it seems like there is, is potential for collaboration, again, I don't know what for sure what the government role is, um, is around uh, museum policies. I mean, there's tremendous flux now in policies of museums around the world with respect to repatriation, not only of indigenous cultural heritage, but also of items acquired, you know, from uh, during the colonial period by the, uh, the colonial empires. Uh, which are now, there's now a lot of discussion of, of repatriating those back to the former colonies. Um, it seems like there could be potential there for American, for U.S. museums, tribal museums, and foreign museums to kind of share information and ideas about these evolving practices and policies and where, where the best practices are. That's great. Thank you. Here's the next question in our chat. This comes from our good friend, Shell. Uh, purely from a resource and not an interventive point of view, do you assist with helping museums or indigenous teams know who to contact for repatriation when it's outside the wheelhouse knowledge of those teams to help establish relations? Um, yes. <laughs> if, <clears throat> you know, like I said, I mentioned earlier, there, sometimes it's, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes it's just a matter of knowing who to contact um, and who, who to get, who you'll get um, traction with. Um, and if, if that's, if it's easier to reach out to us first, um, we are happy to make those connections, especially with, like I said, our, our embassies um, who often have those direct um, uh, relationships with foreign museum personnel. Um, and if they don't, they can make those connections. But a lot of times it's handled um, within country and we don't necessarily at the Cultural Heritage Center make those connections with foreign museums, but we have a way to do that. Um, and even if we do make those connections, that doesn't necessarily mean that we as a State Department um, or as an embassy need to be involved with the repatriation. Oftentimes, we do get asked questions, um, and they're ordinarily sort of, you know, is this a legitimate request to which we refer museums back to the tribes? Um, say if the request is coming from the tribe, then that's who they need to have that relationship with. Um, or again, if it's how to handle a repatriation domestically. So we don't always um, need to be involved after you've contacted us and we make those contacts for you, but we're here to help um, if, if you need that. Thank you, Ashley. Did you want to add anything, Brooke or David, to that? Okay. 
All right, here's our next question. With foreign country ex exposure to NAGPRA via the exchange program, has it inspired indigenous peoples from other countries to pers pursue similar legislation or repatriation efforts? So I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily exposure um, to NAGPRA via the exchange program. I think that a lot of um, museums are looking at their colonial past and reevaluating um, sort of the the way that they came to have those collections, um, and I I think that that's sort of what's inspiring communities to ask for um, uh, items or ancestral remains from, from foreign museums. I, I think that we definitely play a role in that, but our successes have played a role in that. Um, but I don't, I, I really do think that it's more of a change in mindset. Um, and a lot of museums um, are, you know, I think there's people at the top and within those um, foundations that have been around for a long time. And some of those, that personnel is starting to, to rotate to, to new personnel with um, new viewpoints on repatriation and collections management. So I, I really do, I think that it's, it's larger than us, but we are playing a small role in that. And I mean, us is the United States, not, not State Department. <laughs> Thank you. Brooke or David, did you want to add to that one? I guess I would just add that yeah, I do think, I, mean, I don't have a, a much direct experience on this question, but um, just looking at the language of the UN Declaration and the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, uh, the, the outcome document from that, um, you know, the, the repatriation of, of, uh, of cultural heritage is identified as, as important. And uh, so I think that reflects a, a broader interest amongst Indigenous peoples around the world. Um, yeah. Very good, thank you, David. Um, we have a hand raised um, shell, so I'm going to bring you in so you can ask your question live. All right, you are in and you have the floor, Shell. Okay, hi. Um, so I wanted to clarify um, what I was asking because every time I was trying to write it, it wasn't coming out right. So our team is working with National Museums Northern Ireland. And just for the people who are watching to know, we are a perfect example of the State Department not needing to get involved. Essentially, Northern Ireland's museum system said, take your indigenous team and do what needs to be done. Um, and it's like a dream come true, not even going to lie. Um, but my question for you is that there are some um, ancestral remains that are from other areas of the world. And when we're trying to make contact, we want to make sure that we're making <laughs> the appropriate contact. And so we've been using our pan-Indigenous community to be able to do that. And we are very successful, but at some time, we don't know everybody. And are there points in which you are able to help in any way, non-interventive, obviously, because it's a State Department and you don't want to do that, but to, to say, hey, we are aware of this case or that case um, so that we know where to go next. So that was it. And I'm sorry it didn't come out the right way. Thank you. What no, else? that's that's totally fine. Um, so I just want to make sure. So if there, if you come across collections or human rem uh, ancestral remains in, um, in a particular museum and they belong to an indigenous population that's outside of the US, you would like to make contact with that community in order to um, make them aware of the collect collection's existence. Is that right? 
Yes. And then we further, this is how we've been co- creating a collective essentially. And we're just like, it, I, honestly, it really is like a dream come true. We've just created an indigenous collective and we say, would you like to be a part of this? And then they say yes or no. Um, so far, everybody said yes. Um, and then we all work together to make sure that, you know, if one of us is in Northern Ireland and is able to get information that needs to be gotten, then we communicate that to one another. I mean, it really is beautiful. So yes. And sometimes it's just knowing who to communicate with um, once we found something because the Northern Irish team is very honest. We don't know. We need your help. Right. Yeah. So a lot of in-country contacts, again, are are conducted through our embassies. Um, and so we can reach out to the embassy personnel, their cultural affairs officer, um, public affairs office may have contacts within those um, indigenous communities, but also the Cultural Heritage Center um, has the Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation Program. And that that program works um, a lot of times with communities, um, underrepresented communities or indigenous communities um, to preserve and protect cultural heritage. So it's possible, um, and again, the embassy would also have those contacts because the program works through um, embassies to fund those projects, cultural heritage preservation projects. But um, it may be a community that we have worked with before. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you, again, if you're not getting any traction with um, the embassy, you can reach out to us and we can see what contacts we may already have with those communities. Awesome. <laughs> oh, no, that's good news. <laughs> Thank you, Shell. All right, we have a couple more questions. This is a good one. This comes from Teresa Owens, uh, our intern with the Association on American Indian Affairs. So shout out to Teresa. Do you help coordinate contact with tribes not federally recognized? I'm going to let Interior take that question on. I'm trying to remember whether this has come up for us. It doesn't, I don't recall it coming up very often. That I mean, typically the inquiries we get, the requests we get are from federally recognized tribes or Native Hawaiian organizations. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah. It's also not come up from my awareness at the State Department. Um, and when a tribe has reached out regarding a repatriation, a federally recognized or state recognized tribe, um, actually, I don't even know that we've had any inquiries from state recognized tribes, but there hasn't been um, any request from those tribes that we make connections with um, state recognized or um, unrecognized um, communities. So I, I don't also have an answer to that question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question, <laughs> so I'm gonna ask it. Um, so I I have I through uh, through through my tribe when and, and um, most of our conference attendees yesterday heard about the Carl May repatriation, and of course um, you you know that it's it was about an eight year process, and during that time we worked heavily with the Interior, we worked with the State Department, and there was lots of things that happened from from both agencies, like different letters being written and phone calls and things. And I think maybe some of our audience members don't know like, like a specific example, right? And I just wonder if there's some way that you can share like a specific example, like was there a letter written? Like I, I know, I think it was Secretary Jewell at the time wrote a letter on, um, you know, to, to uh, the equivalent in Germany on our behalf at some point. And so I was just wondering if there's like a very specific um, 
like example that you could get from your agencies of, of like how you assisted? I think we could certainly look for those uh, at Interior for useful examples. Some of the assistance was public statements, and of course, those are easy to. Well, there we can go back and find those, and and those are easy to share. Um, I think I, I guess we can take that question back. Uh, well, I. I do have a few notes left over from the presentation yesterday. So I do know that um, in 2015, the Deputy Assistant Secretary um, in Indian Affairs did send a letter directly to the Karl Mai, to the Executive Director of the Karl Mai. Um, and then in 2016, our um, the National NAGPRA Program Manager, Melanie O'Brien, sent a letter to the Foreign Office um, of the Federal Republic of Germany explaining um, how repatriation, that a, a similar repatriation would be handled domestically. Um, and then also in, in 2020, Allison Davis with the Cultural Heritage Center um, did write a fairly extensive um, paper on um, the background of the actions that have happened up until 2020 and then going through um, German museum recommendations on um, collections management and repatriation and found, um, found a line of reasoning for the return of the um, ancestral remains to um, the Sioux tribe. Um, and, you know, I think those are, a, a lot of it is diplomatic writing, honestly. Um, and those are sort of the official documents that get put out. But a lot of the work that we do is really sort of back and forth with emails, getting language um, suitable for both sides um, and encouraging over and over again, encouraging museums to work with tribes and even encouraging embassies to run um, language um, by the tribe before it's given back to the museum um and you know again through through phone calls so it's uh, here and there we've had official statements and letters um but a lot of it really is taken care of um through back and forth um year after year and just sort of making sure that we keep on the um museum and making sure that we're persistent um, and and lifting up whatever communication that tribes have had with museums. Um, so you know, I think that those are pretty universal actions that we take um, from repatriation to repatriation. But it's sort of an example of what we've we've done with the Karl May repatriation. If, if I could add to that, Colleen. Um, sure. I think that Ashley is making a good point that the, these are very case specific. I mean, there's some, there are some principles that reappear across repatriation cases, but each one has its own very specific circumstances um, and issues. Uh, so it, there's not really a single model uh, intervention from the U.S. government. But we have talked about some the kinds of the kinds of points we can make with the foreign government. One is we we can ask them uh, to engage. With the tribe, uh, and and um, uh, we can express support for the tribe's efforts. Uh, we can explain the special status of uh, Indian tribes in the United States and and their status as as sovereign nations, which supports the helps make the case that the museum should work with them directly. And then so, sometimes we can exp explain. Uh, sometimes a natural question in the minds of the, the museum curators might be, well, okay, you're asking us to do this, to repatriation. Would you do this, you know, if the case came up in your own country? And then we can provide that information. Uh, we can explain 
how a similar repatriation would be handled in the United States. And that can help make the case that can help encourage them to, to cooperate. And then there might be other issues that come up. You know, I don't, I don't know if we can anticipate all the different issues that might come up that, that the US government might be able to help with in some way. No, that's great, thank you, very helpful. Um, I don't wanna put you on the spot, Melanie, but I did see uh, Melanie O'Brien had your hand raised and then now it's not. So I just want to be sure if there is anything you wanted to share that you had a moment to do that. Um, also, I don't know how I would know that unless you were brought on stage. So <laughs> uh, there it is. Okay. Uh, Melanie O'Brien, program manager with National NAGPRA. I'm trying to add you to the feed. Here you are. Uh, you have the floor, Melanie. All right. Hi, everybody. Not exactly camera ready today, but I will go ahead and turn it on for you guys. <laughs> um, I, I just jumped in because, um, but I would have said exactly what Ashley said um, with regard to the um, Karl May Museum. And, you know, um, I wasn't able to attend the session about that repatriation, but as you heard from Ashley, the first letter I wrote was in 2016. So, um, I think more than anything, what we can do is continue to assist with these cases. So they come, we work, we continue to work. Um, I would um, I would echo what, what Ashley said, um, that it's a lot of diplomatic process, um, a lot of talking back and forth. Um, NAGPRA in the United States, um, except that it's more of a diplomatic handholding than just a handholding um, here in, in the States. So it's a, it's definitely an interesting process and an interesting experience. And um, I know that the letters in particular that I write tend to have a big impact. Um, although I don't say anything more than what the law of the United States is, but the fact that that as a federal official that I say what the law of the United States is, it seems to have a big impact. Thank you, Melanie. I would, I would say that I agree with that. I think that the letter that was written uh, to Carl May did have a big impact, so. I just want to say thank you for, for all your hard work on that. Um, okay, so we have here. we have another question. Also from Lillian, is there any lobbying effort to get the US to implement more of the 1970 UNESCO or even the, um, the 1995 um, <laughs> uh, uh, conventions. I don't know what convention that is so that they can apply to Native American cultural uh, patrimony that is overseas. I think it's supposed to, I thought it was maybe supposed to be under it, but I don't know. So hopefully you guys know. Um, so I don't know of any lobbying efforts that, um, would do what the question asked. I think that there are, there are, there is an interest having something domestically that would fulfill um, requirements under the 1990 or 1970 UNESCO convention. Specifically, I mentioned earlier the, the STOP Act. Um, so I think that's sort of, it, I mean, I'm not necessarily involved in any 
we aren't involved in any lobbying efforts. Um, but I think that that's sort of where the legislation domestically is is going. I don't know, Brooke, David, do you guys have any? That's my understanding as well as that. I mean, as I understand it, the, the STOP Act would, to some extent, implement some provisions of the 1970 convention. And that's as, as much as I know. I, I, I'm not even sure. I don't know if the U.S. is a party to the 1995 UNIDOA convention. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, Brooke, did you want to add anything to that one? Um, no, I mean, I think Ashley and David pretty much covered it from what we can tell that focus does seem to be on the STOP Act. And, um, you know, since we're not involved in lobbying, we don't probably know for sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all three of you. We just have a few minutes left. And so while I'd like to remind the audience to please use our polls and answer them, it really does help us here at the association. And um, while I'm waiting for the audience to do that, I wanna turn it over to you three for um, final remarks. Um, thank you again for allowing us to have this space to um, answer questions, I hope that it's been helpful. And if anything, I hope that the takeaway from the participants has been that we are open and willing to assist um, and that you can feel free to, to contact any one of us and we will do what we can. Um, and, you know, always with the, um, you know, us keeping in mind that it's, it's tribally driven, not um, something that we are, as the federal government, are are working towards. We always want to um, put the tribe um, out first and make sure that museums are working directly with tribes. Yep. I, I would just echo Ashley's comments and, and thank you for the chance to participate. We are honored to be here with you today and and honored to help out however we can in these, these, these cases. It's well said, David and Ashley. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to um, ask us questions. And please, please don't hesitate to contact us um, if you'd like to continue the conversation. Well, thank you so much to, to all three of you. I think it's so important to have you um, in, in this space and in, the, in having this conversation so that, you know, it's almost like humanizing you. So we, we know who you are and when we want to reach out to you, right? And so I think it's just really beneficial for everyone to, to have some FaceTime with you, even if it's virtually and to understand who you are and, and how to contact and how your agencies might help. So thank you so much. Um, with that, I'm going to end this session. Everything back.